long overdue. I, Laura Lee and I were commenting on the way here that um, I've been a bishop, I'm into my fourth year, and this is the first time I've come. I don't know what happened in terms of the schedule mishaps or whatever, but I'm, I'm more than happy to make up for lost time. It's been a long time. As some of you know, I used to serve as a rector in this diocese uh, before taking off and doing this little circuitous route and then making our way back after the election. So the, actually, the last time I was here was when Mark Roger Miller was the rector. Now that's a long time ago. That's when Roger and I were both very involved in Curcio together and did a lot of Curcios. In fact, let me tell you, can I tell a story? Yeah. This doesn't have anything to do with this for a minute. Um, Roger and I were, I was the rector and Roger was my assisting rector for a women's Curcio out of Canada. And a lot of very good friends of mine were on the team. So we decided to pull a joke. And what happened was, this is how they used to do it. Early, early in the morning on Sunday, the team would gather, all these ladies, and they would all be sort of in robes. I mean, they just got out of bed. They didn't get dressed. And what they did was that they were going to go and sing to the candidates. They didn't know that was happening. That was a surprise. And, but what they did first was they came to our door to sing to us before meeting Roger and I. We were staying in a room over at Canterbury and then go over to the team. So all of these ladies are gathered out here in their you know, nightgowns and robes and slippers and they're holding candles. And it's actually a very holy and tender moment until I appeared and then Roger appeared. And the reason was, was that we put on gor gorilla suits. <laughs> and so the door opened, and I, I do like this, in this gorilla suit. And Roger, of course, who was much taller, peered over the top. And, and one of the members of the team, a woman named Joy Raybaugh, who was an old friend of ours, she said, at first I didn't know whether to laugh or just be shocked. <laughs> but they laughed. So we had this great picture that I still treasure of all of, the, all of these ladies in robes and slippers, and Roger and I in the middle in gorilla suits. <laughs> now, there actually is a talk, believe it or not, between that very sort of silly fun story and what we're doing. And the reason, and here's the surprise. The surprise is John the Baptist. He's the priest in the gorilla suit. That in the midst of us singing Christmas, thinking about the infant, um, I don't know about you, but Larley and I were out last night figuring out what we were buying and what we were going to do before we had a really lovely dinner with Noy and Linda, um, sort of squeezing things in as we could to sort of figure out. We could. I mean, that's what it's like for us right now, right? Isn't that true for you? Not your head. You know, I mean, there's a lot to do between now and getting everything in the mail or getting your house in order or the various things that you'll do to sort of finally celebrate Christmas on the 24th and 25th of December. In the middle of all of that, the church is celebrating a season that feels actually kind of contradictory, and it's called Advent. I mean, so that in the midst of all of this sort of joy and peace and red ribbons and fur, we hear, he's going to come like a refiner's fire, like fuller soap, and who can stand in his appearing? That's <laughs> That was the Malachi lesson. Or the words of John the Baptist, echoing right together the words of Malachi when it says, you know, every mountain is going to be made low. Those are, those are earthquakes. That's disaster, you see. So the thing is, is that how, <laughs> how do we put all of that together? Particularly as in the midst of this season. Because you see, Advent has a very specific purpose. The purpose is, well, actually two. One is to set the context for the coming of Christ to the manger. To say, in essence, that's not the end of the story. It's, in fact, the next chapter in a story that isn't finally completed until Jesus returns a second time. A new heaven and a new earth appear and all is finally made right. All false judgments are cast down. And that's when, like the Isaiah reading actually happens, where 
the wolf lies down with the lamb. And all of those lovely pictures that we have of peace and tranquility. The picture in heaven in Revelation where it says, in that place there is no pain, there is no grief, for God wipes away every tear from every eye. As a reading that's often read at funerals. That's when all of that finally breaks forward. And all of the brokenness that we know in this life is finally set aside. Because you see, Advent reminds us in a very, very powerful and strong way that what we experience as Christians right now is in fact incomplete. Yes, if you've said yes to Christ Jesus, if you've been baptized in water, if you say Jesus is Lord, the very presence of God lives in your heart. The very presence of God that is at work in the world changing that world and preparing it for Christ's appearing, which means things are going to go badly as well as well. All of the things that you and I know now that are just horror shows, whether we're talking about shootings in the United States, the persecution of Christians overseas, the rise and fall of regime, the uncertainty of the economy. I mean, you know, we could make a very long list, right? That all of that, in the midst of all of that, God is changing things in a way that prepares the way for his son. So what we know now in terms of this both inner incompleteness and what we see in our world, in fact, creates in us a kind of longing. A longing for things to be made right. A longing for the violence that our world knows to cease. A longing for changes within us that we can more and more become the people that really do live out in the midst of the chaos of this culture. It, uh, live out a kind of peace, a grace, a winsomeness, a confidence in the midst of all that we are going on. Because you see, and where does that confidence come from? That's where we go to the Philippian lesson. It, in some ways, the bright spot in all three of the lessons today. Although the others are important because they set a historic context. It says in a very clear way, God is at work. And it's not just some ephemeral wish somewhere, but he's actually working right now in history. That's the point of this very long introduction that Jada read when she read the beginning of the Luke lesson, where Luke literally lays out a clear historic context because he, he mentions known rulers in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, a real historic person. When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, another real historic person. Herod was ruler of Galilee, Philip ruler of the region of Iturea, on and on. He mentions about five different monarchs to say, this isn't some myth. We're not just kind of making this up. This is not Homer's Odyssey or the Iliad which is an amazing story. Those were some of my favorite books as a teenager. But it's myth. It says some important lessons, but it's based in no historic fact whatsoever. Luke, by contrast, is laying out a very clear historic context to say, I'm not just telling you a bunch of made-up stories. This actually happened in history. And the point for you and me is not only to give that story that kind of historic validity, but also to say God really is at work in the world. It's not just sort of he's, that he's sitting up on a throne someplace going, well, let's see how they're going to work this one out. Instead, he is at work. To know that, to know that God is at work in the world, is to also know that God is actually at work in us. In the Philippian lesson, Paul makes, I think, what's a pretty bold statement. He says, I am confident of this. I mean, listen to that kind of strength. That the one, meaning God, who began a good work in you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, God is at work in us right now. So it's not just that we have within us the presence of God by virtue of baptism and the declaration of Jesus as Lord. We also can trust that he is there actually doing something in us 
shaping us, molding us, at work in us. <laughs> that we're not in this life as we're by, you know, by ourselves. You know, I think sometimes the way it can often feel is, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can with what I have. And what the scripture is trying to say is, there's actually more to that story. That God is at work in me and in you. And he desires to be at work in you in a way that actually creates personal change. Because you see, he loves us. He is for us. He want us, wants us to be able to walk with the kind of poise, the kind of confidence, and the kind of courage. It takes courage to walk with confidence these days. That says, I know that God is at work. And not only that, I'm willing for him to work in me. And not only that, I'm willing for him to use me in the lives of other people. That's what it means to, in fact, believe that God is at work in the world and that God is at work in me. It's he's at work, thank God, I need it. So he is shaping me. Sometimes I'm conscious of that, sometimes I'm not. It's subterranean. It's not always evident to the eye, but I know, I know he's in here. And more importantly, that he is willing not only to be at work in me, but to be at work in me so that I might be of use to him in the world. So in other words, the point of God being at work in me is not just so that I can, in essence, feel better about myself. <coughs> so out of that, I can just do whatever I want with a certain level of confidence. No. In other words, God is not working us to, in essence, bolster our own self-centeredness. Because that's what that is, you see. God is at work in us so that we can be available for him to use us. You see, a part of what all of this upheaval in the world shows us is that we live in a world that is in profound need. And it is in profound need of men and women, ordinary people just like you and me, who are willing in the world in which we live to be available for him to use us, to give, to care, to reach out, to be in the midst of the fear, be people of real confidence, to be courteous when things are thrown at us, to actually work in a way that provides clear solutions for some of the problems that you and I face. Because to live in that confidence actually opens us up to God's wisdom. You see, if I'm afraid, if I'm not operating out of a kind of combination of self-centeredness and fear, all I want to think about is how I can protect myself. That means I'm actually very unavailable for God to use me in anybody else's life because I'm not going to take the risk. I'm too frightened. And believe me, it is exactly that kind of attitude that is the work of the devil. It is not the work of God. Paul is very plain in Timothy. God has not given us the spirit of fear. But instead, he's given us the antidote, which is power. In other words, I have God's power in me. Love, because love is the opposite of fear. And a sound mind. In other words, he provide, in that place of confidence, he provides in us a kind of inner clarity that gives us the capacity in the midst of difficult situations to say, okay, God, what now? And to be available for him to use us. Sisters and brothers in Christ, if I didn't believe that, I couldn't be a bishop. And I want to say that's the call for us. To know that God is at work in the world to know that God is at work in us is meant to be the equipment, the substance, the stuff that we need to be available for him to use us. Wherever the need might be. You don't have to go to Africa. There's plenty of need here. And be open to how God, in fact, might want to make a difference. How does God want to use Christ Church Longwood to make a difference in this community. 
How does God want to use you in your place of work to make a difference in this community? How does God want to use you among your friends to make a difference in this community? How can you be that person of confidence who knows something of the peace of Christ so that where you are, you can be a servant of the gospel. You can be someone who can be that channel that God uses that really makes a positive difference in the world in which you live, in the world in which I live. That's what it really means to be a Christian. That's, the, in fact, the meaning of confirmation. Look at those promises carefully. The key word that you'll hear again and again and again is the word service. Because to commit is to say, I'm willing to serve. I'm not just there to get my spiritual needs met. Instead, I'm here so that I might get those needs met that I might be available for God to use me. That's what we're really doing here this morning. We're saying, in essence, in the midst of this Advent season, God, if there are changes you want to work in me, I'm willing. I don't know how that's going to work, but I'm willing. God, if you want to use me in the lives of other people, Sounds kind of terrifying, but I'm willing. Just give me the courage. Show me what I'm supposed to do. And I want you to know something. I am confident, confident, that people who begin to pray prayers like that, they'll see things in their circumstances they hadn't seen before. They'll see things in people that they hadn't seen before. So that God will use you if you're willing. He will. Because he's looking for men and women who belong to him, who have said, yes, this is what we've signed up for, you see, for God to use us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray, and then Patricia is going to come forward for confirmation. And I would urge you, pay attention to the commitments that you are making with your mouth in the liturgy today. And ask God in the midst of this Advent season to show you, Lord, what does this mean for me and for my life? Don't just let it be stuff that sort of rolls off the top of your head. That's that's actually tremendous hypocrisy. But instead, find a way to mean what you say and see what God might do in your life. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you are at work. And that Paul's word to us, that I am confident that the one who has begun a good thing in you will continue it to the day of Jesus Christ, that we would know the fruit of that in our lives. Thank you that we are yours, that you love us dearly and tenderly, that in you there is forgiveness, there's grace, there's mercy, and that you will never let us go. So fill us, God, with that kind of tender, strong confidence that wherever we are and wherever we are serving, we might be available for you. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.